Coming up in this week, computer hardware, Samsung 840, 840 Evo drive slowing down over time. What? Acer's affordable 4K G-Sync gaming monitor, Oculus Crescent Bay, Haswell E loves Linux, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 286, recorded September 25th, 2014. Samsung 840 and 840 Evo are losing speed. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Harry's. For the guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code TWITCH when you check out. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most delightful, and most engaging news about computer hardware, desktops, laptops, tablets. We even like cell phones in the off weeks. Joining me today, not Mr. Ryan Shrout, who's apparently verbally engaged with the NVIDIA and EVGA people right now, but Josh Walworth from PCPer.com, currently located, ladies and gentlemen, somewhere in Wyoming. And it's yeah. not sunny here. <laughs> Is it officially... Have you guys officially hit the sort of winter phase? It's, or uh, it it's still... you know, we've had a we've had a nice fall so far. We, we thought it was going to be bad. Second week of September, it uh, snowed, mm -hmm. and then uh, suddenly it it just had two weeks of in the seventies of lovely, lovely weather with very little wind, which nice. southeast Wyoming is a big deal. It's a big much like. Deal. Northeastern Nevada, like, why is there 40 knots of wind? Because yeah. it's between October and March. Oh. <laughs> but I'll the Aspens just... are all gold and still have their leaves, so. Oh, that's the best sound nice. ever. It is. The walk under the Aspens. Oh, my goodness. What, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to defer to the guest today. What's the most exciting story for you this week? There's some actually really interesting stuff going on. Given that it's uh, everything sort of relaxing after the week of cell phones and iPhone six and IDF and and suddenly you know it, it's <laughs> it's got to be the GTX nine seventy and nine eighty. Uh, they've Nvidia has done some really interesting things without uh, without having a new process node to uh, rely upon, and so that so far has been one of the more interesting stories. That and the precipitous drop of the stock exchange after it hit a record high. <laughs> That was all you're doing, wasn't it? Yes. I shorted everything. Yes, that's because I'm actually secretly the wealthiest man in the universe. And I play with the stock market because it's the, Tuesday. The uh, Koch brothers hate him. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, no. Let's not even go there. Just don't open that can of worms. It'll get right. ridiculous quickly. Actually, uh, if I were... A billionaire. I wouldn't be so excited about this. Have you guys heard about this? I, I know Burke has. I think Burke was panting about it earlier. This thing right here, uh, thermal.com is a website. Seek is the name. And it is an actual, I mean, a lot of people were excited. Did you see the uh, the FLIR 1, the iPhone 5 add-on at CES, Josh? I did not. Oh man! So basically, it's a like a three hundred and fifty dollar back that slides onto an iPhone 5s. And what we're looking at right here, uh, there's one for Android. There's one for any of the iPhones uh, with a Lightning connector, and it um, it's crazy uh, because it's essentially a two hundred dollar thermal imaging camera. So if I if you pull it up, so I, I kind of find this find have found this stuff fascinating ever since we installed one of Fleer's Pathfinders into uh, my truck for an episode of System a thousand years ago, and it allows you essentially night vision, right? Because it's doing thermal differentiation. Um, were you hunting micro down terrorists? Were you were you launching Hellfire missiles at anyone? Do you ever have one of those nights uh, on a small highway in Wyoming where all of the coyotes try to stuff themselves underneath your truck? Yes. Um, my interest in, so, you know, this is relatively close range stuff, but what we're looking at right here is that's, that's, it's a tough environment in doors during the day because our office is actually about 75 degrees. But what that is, is a bunch of people walking down the hallway. And what's crazy is you can have a pitch black room. That's the obligatory picture of someone's hand before they leave the handprint. But 
what you're looking at these images because it's not measuring visible light waves but infrared white light waves you can basically see in a perfectly black room um you're not going to see as much detail as you would sort of with a you know two or three megapixel camera so, um, so essentially jody foster would have killed for this back in 1988 oh yeah or whatever year that was 92 <laughs> well it's funny so you see that right there so this is one of our editing rooms, right? And the editing rooms sit next to these huge windows and they get up to like 100 degrees. So we have uh, standalone, uh, those sort of roll-in AC units. This is the hose walking out of the AC unit. If I put this into temperature mode, that hose will measure between 95 and 105 degrees. And right over here, we have a basic human body running at like 97, 98.6. Um, but what's crazy about this is whether you're using this to look at sort of the thermal imaging from a building, let me pull this back. Um, the the even used, um, you know, like a five or eight year old handheld uh, thermal imaging camera, like the kind that you see contractors carrying, um, is crazy, right? So right there, you're looking at basically the heat loss inside of the building. Okay, that's that's the security aspect. Is there somebody in the backyard? And it's kind of trippy when you realize that you know you can't see anyone, but they glow really brightly on the market. Oh. It's, Somebody's been walking through the house. Somebody was apparently using this in the beta phase to tell whether or not their dog had been uh, sleeping on the couch. <laughs> I think that's actually Velociraptor tracks. Uh, I hate Velociraptor tracks. I know. Um, this is, uh, let's see, that is the classic uh, northbound cat from the southbound view. But that was basically pitch black. Couldn't see the cat at all in the backyard uh, until I shot the image at it. And it's it's interesting because this is, we've never seen anything like this at this price range. Um, the, you know, thermal imaging camera um, is typically selling even used a couple, three, four years old for like $1,000 uh, on eBay. New, I think a Pathfinder, which is a, a higher resolution, like 320 by 240 sensor is somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,500. And that's a kit you have to install yourself. Um, so this is pretty crazy. 200 bucks for Android, 200 bucks for iPhone, $199. Uh, orders are up now at thermal.com. I'm fascinated by it. I'm also sort of, you know, I, 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 I am really, really into figuring out where the thermal loss in my house is uh, and people are using them for hunting and for looking for animals while they're camping. Um, it's interesting uh, and it's cheap for what this is. This is literally like a tenth of the price of anything out there other than the FLIR one. And the FLIR one is only going to work with the iPhone 5 or 5S. So I'm pretty excited about this. We'll see what we can hack this into on an episode of uh, Die Trying in the near future. I also want to see more resolution. Uh, and the software is in beta, but it's it, they're doing a pretty good job of updating it. I'm kind of curious to see how well it works because they're claiming the the thermal, basically when you put it into the temperature mode, um, so if I actually get the application to come up, and there's an actual temperature mode. Well, <laughs> did I mention it's in beta? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. So if you put it into the thermal mode, um, it'll take a temperature and they're claiming within an accurate of a degree, which is pretty good for a $200 piece of software that's in beta. But oh, let's see if we can get, there we go. And the wall is not nearly as hot, although it's still hotter than heck in this office. But yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's really I'm just, cool. I'm really excited about this, but I've also been playing about the like playing with these and not being able to afford them for like eight years now <laughs> i'm like yes there's one i can afford and still well it's gonna children. be great for you know people who want to like see hot spots on a motherboard you just take a picture right. with that 200 dollars thing instead of i remember when a non-tech got uh, some 3500 hundred dollar flare thing that they're excited about it's like 200 bucks dude it's great actually 200 I could have sworn I had a picture of a keyboard in here. Although you can see the windows just losing heat on my neighbor's house right there. They're still tuning the software. That's not my favorite image. <laughs> it's also amazing when you realize how much heat is held in by uh, concrete. Um, yeah, there's a lot of thermal density there. That's a, that's a sidewalk at night. And then... Yeah. Uh, yeah, the steps on the fronts of houses just retain an absolute massive amount of of heat. Thermal mass is cool, man. Um, should, I, should I take a keyboard shot really quickly? Take there a keyboard go. shot real quickly. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the MacBook Air. Will this show off your uh, usual password keys? <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting when you when you say that. Um, you would have to be. Oh, there it is. In terms of an actual laptop keyboard, so I don't know if you can see that, but the it's running 100 degrees. I've seen them as high as 105 degrees in our office playing around with it. So that's a MacBook Air keyboard. Um, I don't think your password's going to show up very well unless all of your keys are down at the bottom half of the at yeah. the bottom half of the keyboard. I have not had a chance to walk up to a banking uh, uh, an ATM machine yet. <laughs> But I will do that after this show and hopefully not get arrested in the process. Because the SFPD, they, they tend to be cranky when they're cranky. Um, not that I would know anything about that. But Seek is the name of the device. Thermal.com is the website. Uh, they're taking orders now. So I'm excited about that. So what happened with uh, so, uh, Tom Peterson from NVIDIA stopped by the PC per office today? That is correct. Uh, Tom came by to talk about the recently released GTX 980 and 970. Uh, they spoke about the architecture. He answered a bunch of questions about the uh, about the product and where it's being placed. And he also did some other, you know, non GTX, uh, well, video card uh, uh, type questions. Uh, G Sync is, of course, a very very popular topic mm -hmm. to discuss. And so uh, he provided quite a few insights into that uh tom is always a really interesting guy to talk to he's, he's one he's incredibly smart two he can he can take complex not issues but but concepts 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 <laughs> i speak very well this evening uh he takes complex concepts and he can boil them down simple enough that most people can understand and so he's he's kind of a joy to have he's he's funny and um uh, the GTX uh, 900 series look to be really, really good. These are based on the Maxwell architecture. Uh, the first one we saw was the G GTX 750 and 750Ti. What was interesting about those parts is, uh, you know, it was a small die size, pulled very little power, very, very efficient, but performed much higher mm -hmm. than one would expect. Uh, see, one of the big problems that the graphics guys have gone through is that three years ago, a little bit more, maybe three and a half, mm -hmm. the first 28 nanometer parts came out. And as you know, with especially graphics, when they do process node jumps, they get more <laughs> performance, they get better power efficiency. All of these really wonderful things come very, very simple for them because they have these easy jumps. I mean, every right. 16 to 18 months, you had a new process node that you could rely upon to refresh your entire product line. Well, this is not the case. We've had 20 nanometer for quite a few years, and it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And so NVIDIA had to really think about the products, redesign them, uh, put some interesting uh, ideas and concepts into play that they learned from their Tegra K1 products. Now, of course, they also are you know, dabbling in, in the ARM uh, infra sphere, and so that of course is a very very power efficient architecture because you know it's running all of our cell phones. So they were able to uh, take a lot that they've learned from the K1, which is probably mm -hmm. their most advanced ARM SOC yet, and they were able to apply them to these big GPUs. And so they have a product that is slightly bigger than the old GTX 680 and which was also renamed the GTX 770. It runs about 25 watts lower in overall TDP, but mm -hmm. it outperforms the much larger, much higher TDPs GTX 780 Ti, which is still another 28 nanometer part, but that's a 250 watt part. It's almost uh, 600 millimeters square in size. So you've got right. this little GTX 980 that is about 390 millimeters, 398, I think I heard. Mm -hmm. 165 to 175 watts TDP, and it outperforms it. In, in fact, it outperforms everything out there. It is the really the, the fastest single-chipped single graphics uh, card 
period, in the world, and one of the most advanced. And so they added a couple of uh, new uh, anti-aliasing techniques, which, you know, for a guy who, who likes AA, like me. <laughs> you don't uh, like Jaggies? It's, it's, I don't like the Jaggies at all. I was really <laughs> excited about anti-aliasing when 3DFX um, introduced it with the uh, the Voodoo series. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've only grown to love it from then on out. So, overall, these are fantastic parts. Uh, the GTX 980 is released for $549. You can still get it online, still in stock in some places. The uh, GTX 970 is probably the more interesting one. It's got, you know, fewer shader cores. It's it's less powerful. It's a lower TDP. Mm -hmm. But it's only three hundred twenty nine dollars, and it outperforms right. pretty much the R nine two ninety and the older GTX seven eighty. Notice I didn't say GTX seven eighty Ti. That's of course a higher end SKU. That's a whole lot more money. So um, overall, Nvidia has kind of taken a a stab at uh, a better price performance than we've seen them do in a long time. Usually, they've gone ahead and and kept their parts up in terms of price as compared to AMD, uh, who is, you know, more known as the price performance leader. Uh, mm -hmm. With the GTX 970, they're really hitting the sweet spot. It's a 4-gig card, runs really super fast. Um, it outperforms previous generation stuff, and it just it sips power as compared to other cards. And again, this, this is a 28 nanometer part. They haven't done anything exceptional with the process. It's all... Mm -hmm been design and of course when you're dealing with what some five billion transistors you've got some leeway to do some things there <laughs> and they did them they did um, oh my goodness i'm looking at uh, uh i was looking at newegg now i'm on amazon.com uh asus strix gtx 970 temporarily out of stock msi gtx 970 temporarily out of stock oh, uh, yeah. for 430 dollars the gigabyte geforce gtx 970 uh, for four hundred and thirty dollars, three left in stock. Um, yeah, they're only gouging you a little bit with that. <laughs> well, uh, if earlier in stock, I saw. If... Yeah, earlier I saw Newegg had some about four hours ago, but I guess that that stock is now again depleted. So these are good cards, and they're not overpriced as compared to no. what we have seen in the past. That was kind of like a. It was a pleasant surprise. Like I can't decide yeah. if if Nvidia feels like they can just beat on AMD. And they went with that pricing or if, you know, they just, it just kind of fascinates me. <laughs> well, there's two things. One, the, the die size on this is not much bigger than what the GTX 680, GTX 770 were. Um, it's still a 256-bit bus. And so uh, PCB costs are, are less. You have less complexity on the PCB. Um, the, the, there's fewer, you know, uh, traces and, and ball grids. On the uh, the GPU, uh, all these things kind of come together to help drive the cost down because it's it's not as expensive as say like the GTX 780, which has a 384 bit bus and has a GPU that is again 550 mm -hmm. to 600 millimeters squared. So I mean that's some that's some serious savings for a part that performs as well, if not a little bit better than the previous top end single GPU card. It's interesting. I was, I was reading uh, Ryan's review of the Acer XB280HK, he says, as he cribs from the screen to his right. So it's a 28-inch 4K gaming monitor, G-Sync. He loves this monitor. And I was I was laughing, like, because we were talking, like, when will, you know, when will 4K gaming get more affordable? Um, so now you you can use, a you know, the the bare minimum graphics configuration to run the the XB280HK G-Sync's monitor is a simple, excuse me, a single GeForce GTX 980 uh, or an SLI configuration of GTX 780 or 780 Ti. Um, you know, so $800 for the monitor, which is not bad. Uh, it was interesting though, uh, cause even with, uh, he used a pair of GeForce GTX 980 cards in SLI. Uh, and even then with a Sandy Bridge six core processor, 16 gigabytes DDR3, um, crisis three wouldn't run until they went down to medium settings, you know, and dropped, <laughs> uh, you know, MSA, uh, anti-aliasing down from four X to two X. And that got them to 40 to 55 frames per second. Um, Metro last night, Battlefield 4, running under 60 frames per second for most of our playtime. Um, he's excited about this monitor. 
he 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 likes 4K. Uh, we had a discussion about that last night. He would rather have a 4K monitor. I I would rather have a uh, you know a 1440p that is uh, 144 hertz G Sync. But he's the other. He's the opposite. He he would rather have that 4K really really tight pixel spacing and uh, lots of pixels. But boy, you got to have some horsepower to drive that. Yeah. That's a that's a pretty expensive system he was running, uh, <laughs> yeah. running to power that beast. Um, oh my goodness! Yeah, it's it's been interesting. We were laughing. We did this this low end gaming PC build, and people are like the 750 Ti. It's worthless. And I'm like, dude, what are you gaming on? You know, because yeah. um, 1080p you know, like, gaming doesn't take that much. It it does not anymore. Now I think what's kind of interesting is. Mm -hmm. Do you remember some of the first widescreen LCDs that came out? It was around 2003, 2004. Yes. 1100 bucks to 1500 bucks a pop. And you're talking 1920 by 1200. And right. then the the new 30 inches came out that were 25, 60 by 1600. Again, they were introduced at 1100 to $1500. And the 4K monitors, the first ones that really super expensive Asus 3200 bucks. <laughs> and now, now we've got G-Sync based 4K monitors. Admittedly, it's it's using that TN panel, which right. is not perfect, but it is a huge step up from traditional TN panels. 4K G-Sync, eight hundred bucks. That's pretty amazing. We're living well. It's uh, I mean it's a, it's a shame that the glass isn't a little bit better because that would be a huge monitor for people who live in Photoshop and video editing and and who can actually take advantage of all those pixels. Yeah, um, and it's it's rated but, at ninety eight percent RGB, sRGB. Hmm. So it's 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 much better than it used to be. You still yeah. apparently um, the weakness of it is if you try to go portrait mode. Um, the bottom portion, which is now on your left-hand side, it, it gets dark. I mean, it does have the color shift. Right. And if you look, you know, go down here and you, you look <laughs> at it, <clears throat> then you'll notice that the, the, the colors do shift. It's not as bad left to right and from the top, but it still has that whole TM thing that if you're looking at it from below, it looks just kind of funky. Funky. Man, that Asus PB278Q, $478, although it's only a mere 60 hertz at 2560 by 1440. I assume you would be going for the Asus Swift, the 2560 by 1440, 144 uh, the Swift hertz. Apparent, it's apparently a fantastic product. Mm -hmm. I'd All love you to do is it. sell them a truck and buy a monitor. Won't the wife be thrilled? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, Pharonix, ladies and gentlemen, got crazy. Uh, they were trying to do uh, Haswell E on Linux uh, a week or two ago. Their X99 motherboard uh, ate its own tail, released the magic smoke, and died, uh, much to their chagrin. It turns out, however, when you don't kill your motherboard and when your motherboard doesn't die on you, I'm not assigning any blame to anyone at Pharonix. Please don't take offense. Having released the magic smoke from several motherboards myself, uh, Apparently, Linux loves Haswell E. <laughs> I think pretty much everything loves Haswell E. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. funny. Like when the, this is, I think might be my new favorite benchmark ever is the timed Linux kernel compilation version 3.1. Uh, so the Intel Pentium G3258, I think it's like, is that 70 seconds? No. Sorry, I'm going to have to like make the chart bigger because apparently it's time for me to get reading glasses. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You're only love what, like 47? 40, yeah, 44 actually. 44, you're only two years older than me. It's just, but it's, been, a, it's been an ugly 20 years. You'd be shocked. Uh. <laughs> Nine years of rugby advanced a lot of things. Yeah, it's yes. crazy. 40 second kernel compile. Compared to like a Core i7 5960X, which is like 210 seconds. In any case, if you are a Linux user, there is no reason not to spend all of the money on the next 99 and it has well E. Yeah. Are you, you over Oculus kinda, yet? You know what's kind of, I, I like, go back to this other one. Uh, do yeah. you know what's kind of ironic about that benchmark? What's that? That it, it does so fast and 
so well, but if you remember the old Pentium 3 1133, <laughs> what did they get nailed on? The Linux <laughs> compile benchmark. <laughs> so, Intel's well, come a long ways. They've Apparently, they've accepted Linux and the other yes. Unices and yes. FreeBSD. Oh, my goodness. Have you, uh, are, are you excited about Oculus still at this point? You know, the Crescent not, Bay prototype that came out? Yeah, it's supposed to be a lot better. But, uh, you know, I think they still have that whole little grid problem because of the optics. Uh, yeah. But, you know, this one's got the, the integrated headphones and sound. Um, it's got the external uh, dots so that mm -hmm. if you have, you know, cameras out there, it'll do head tracking a lot more effectively. And so right. they're not going to probably put this one out for sale, but it is, you know, a kind of a development kit that I think they will probably sprinkle about. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking for my waistline, it would be nice to have one of those. And then that, that thing where you stand in and you run and right. shoot things, <laughs> that would be nice for me. It probably wouldn't be nice for my family as I'm, running through my office and shouting <laughs> obscenities and Counter-Strike as people are shooting me and camping and hacking. So uh, I've, I've noticed that about Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike players may be the most blasphemous players I've ever been in an office with. <laughs> ever. So, yep. uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. What do you think about uh, the VR stuff? I keep having trouble because I've seen it so many times over the last 20 years and, and it sucks less than it ever has before. Um, at this point, I'm really curious. I'm curious to see if, because, you know, now that, that they are inside of, of Zuckerman land, that they're inside of Facebook, that they can kind of take as long as they need to, to perfect this. And I'm kind of curious if they're going to do that because they're obviously like, you know, Samsung is playing around with, you know, it, Google's playing around with their sort of cardboard box. Um, mm -hmm. VR system, Samsung's releasing uh, a, a, a headset, all these other companies are starting to join in. So I'm really kind of curious to see what they're going to do. Uh, you know, I've heard, you know, one friend of mine who was instantaneously vomiting on the first round, much like Ryan, um, uh, you know, got to see one of the, the, the second round uh, products or get eyes on one of the second round products and they had improved it considerably so he could go several minutes before he wanted to run to the nearest garbage can. I, I'm really curious, you know, whether it's going to be something where you just look around and pretend you have 19 monitors uh, or if it's going to be something where it, it, it's really practically well, engaging you, for long periods of time. You know why Zucker, what's his bucket, bought this in the first <laughs> place. Obviously, he has read the things like Neuromancer and right. Snow Crash the, where he wants where to you build actually the black have, sun. yeah, he he <laughs> maybe, but <laughs> it is the next step to to Facebook. You put these on, you're in a room with all of your friends. You're in, you're gonna go and walk and down the street, and uh, all these other people you know will just you'll you'll have face to face visits. You'll you'll go to a bar that is uh, you know populated by people from Australia, and New Zealand, and England, and Scotland, and. And all these other places, and, and it's going to, you know, hopefully it'll be nice enough and 3D graphics will be more photorealistic and that mm -hmm. you'll just be there. I can't remember the uh, the last, you know, kind of, you know, VR book that I read. Oh, it was just a couple of years ago. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, make it so realistic and interactive that that's where he's looking at. It's not just games. He's looking to integrate that product into social media to take it to the next level. It's where Second City wanted to be, but just <laughs> never could. It's just a little early for that one. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if somebody was in the office like, why did Facebook buy it? And all I could think was virtual makeouts, Snapchat and 3D. <laughs> 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 I got the most piteous stare. And then they were like, oh, God. <laughs> it's the next million dollar idea. Yeah. Oh, man. What's going on with, uh, what's going on with USB 3.1 or 31? 3.1. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the, the new USB connection that is reversible. So as the joke goes, you don't have to plug in your USB cable three times to get it correct. 
<laughs> It'll just go in the, the what. And what they're doing is not only is it USB 3.0, but they're adding DisplayPort to it. So DisplayPort will be integrated in, and it can handle 100 watts of power through that cable, supposedly. So you've got <sighs> multiple things that uh, you can do all at the same time, and they're hoping that that will be the answer. I did get to see one of the 100-watt cables uh, at uh, Intel Developer Forum. Did you it try is, biting on it? I thought about it, but, but you know, it was connected to 100 yeah. watts of power at the time. It was powering a, a, a rather substantial laptop at the time. And uh, uh, I decided to not orphan my or children go. just yet. And, but it was interesting because it was, it's because they said like, wait a minute, you're carrying hundred watts of power. He's like, well, you're going to have to have, have a, a cable that's spec for that. And he pointed, you know, and it was a big fat cable compared to, uh, you know, one. it was, yeah, well, even bigger than the, remember the first generation USB cables where you're kind of like, that's a lot of cable. Well, it was even bigger than that. And there was a, a fair amount of copper inside of it. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of curious. It seems like, you know, uh, Intel made vague announcements at, at IDF that they're finally going to eliminate the cables. It's going to be a cableless world. We're going to eliminate the cable. And it's like, but just in case, we're going to make sure we can cram everything over the USB spec, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. I was like, what? Well, you know, everybody hates cables. And yes. if you can just get away with one, then more power to you. It's a good dream. Yeah. It's a very good dream. Not a very good dream. It's kind of funny. the The same week that the the uh, the I want to say the Samsung uh, the Samsung is one of the last two drives standing in uh, the Tech Report uh, solid state drive endurance test. Um, Alan has, did a great write up on this, uh, and I'm going to read the title: Samsung 84840 Evo susceptible to flash read speed degradation over time. Um, and it's interesting because people have been reporting lately. It's kind of one of those viral moments on the web where people start talking uh, in forums and start comparing notes. But essentially, um, once data gets, I think, did Alan say it was about a month out? Um, the longer you wait, starts, basically data reads on the 840 and 840 Evo. Um, the longer you wait, the slower they read. Uh, by about a month out, um, EEC is kicking in and it's taking a considerable amount of time to sort of read these files. No one's lost any data, um, but it's kind of an interesting thought that because they're not sort of constantly, you know, refreshing and kicking the tires and the individual bits on the SSD, I can hear Alan cringing um, <laughs> with my oversimplification, um, which, you know, saves wear and tear on the drive. Um, but they're also having issues in that case where it just is taking a long time to open up files. Samsung's acknowledged it. Um, you know, Alan summed it up. He said, over time, flash cell voltage, this is his theory, his hypothesis. Over time, flash cell voltage is slightly drift. Flash circuitry is designed to compensate for this by varying the read voltage thresholds and using varying levels of error detection and correction mechanisms. Three, some for unforeseen coordination issue between the flash and the controller uh, is resulting in slower than normal read speeds for flash that has been storing data undisturbed for weeks or months. And the thing that really kind of brought it home for me when, was when Alan pointed out you know, you can't, it's not like you can, you, you could actually, you know, run something like disk fresh to sort of, you know, spank the bits and keep them, you know, uh, charged up. But if you do stuff like some friends of mine who edit videos where they store terabytes of data uh, on SSDs, not terabytes, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data gigabytes. on SSDs, yeah. yes, you know, on shelves and they pull a project down and they work on it and they put the project back on for two or three months. It could take days to open up a video project. Um, I exaggerate probably slightly. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. Also, Alan was, was you know, strongly pointing out that uh, no one's losing data. It's just really, really slow because the, the ECC, the error correction is kicking in. You know and what the Samsung, best part about this is? What's that? This is my OS drive. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Just... it gets 50 meg writes on the vast majority of 50 meg reads. Oh. I'm so, oh, so man. happy. Uh, what was kind of interesting is that it's also thermally bound as well because uh, oh, really? the controller, it's doing the ECC on it. So if you've got a warmer case, it's going to be slower. So he has a neat little graph in there that it shows it starts reading fast, 
but then it gets this uh, this big 400 gig file that uh-huh. they've got, and it's just slow, 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 slow. And during that slow part, and right at the end, he moved it underneath a fan, so the fan started blowing on it, and the case went down about four or five degrees, and you can see the performance actually jumped up about five to ten percent because it was the uh, the controller was was becoming thermally limited and slowing down i haven't thought about drive cooling in a really long time and yeah suddenly we thought it's going we were, to be part of my life again yeah we, thought we were <laughs> we were done with that with the 10,000 rpm raptors did you immediately like start digging around in the parts pile for a for a uh, a biscuit Another, fan to to point at your drive no, no i did not <laughs> And fight it, fight it until oh, you absolutely so positively angry. have to. Angry. Well, it's oh, well. a great drive yeah. as long as you write to it a lot. All I don't lot. know. It's, well, it's interesting. Samsung actually, and Samsung did respond. Um, it says they will fix it. And let me read the exact quote because I, while I am always proud of a company for acknowledging, uh, there it is. Samsung recognizes the seriousness of any potential degradation of read performance on old data. We are testing and validating the circumstances that potentially causes performance drop and will work diligently to resolve the issue. So Alan's hoping that it's something he can fix in, in firmware. Because uh, if not, um, that would be a monster recall from hell, uh, given the number of drives that those guys have sold. So interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Also, Disk Fresh is awesome. <laughs> I've never used it, but I may have to do that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I now immediately, uh, immediately wanted to run on my machine. So it's essentially it's a utility that writes, um, reading and writing each sector and making your disk more reliable for storage, which is something that giant server farms are supposed to do automatically. Probably mm-hmm. not your local Windows box. Pureandsoftware.com slash disk disk fresh. Endorsed by Alan Melventano. But that or not at least so fresh SSD. <laughs> Just write to it over and over again. Petabytes, man. Get at least a petabyte and a half out of it. Dude, we are both fans of Gratos. Yeah. I was, I was laughing. I was like, where did he... Where, I, was, I was like, Grado came up in my feed again. And I was like, oh, Josh is a fan. Why is Josh talking about that? Yeah, I saw your review of the... Uh, the SR sixty E's, and uh, I thought that uh, you know I'd been talking to some of the you know one of the guys from Grado, and I, I thought it was kind of interesting that you took a look at them and and uh, had a pretty positive review of uh, of the product, and and uh, I think I'd shown you this. I mean, I'd bought these ten years ago. These are the uh, the original SR one twenty fives. They have been well fun. loved. Well loved. In fact, so loved that I really need to replace the ear pads badly. <laughs> badly. I am on my third set of ear pads on my SR80s. I uh, replaced one of the halos from a cup. Um, uh, and other than that, they are still. Perfect. Uh, they're not. They're not the best headphones for throwing into a knapsack uh, and beating on. Um, you know, a, a, a Sony. Uh, uh, one of the folding Sony headsets is probably a much better option for that. Um, but the they sound fantastic, and those are the incredibly odd ear pads, yeah. the G cushions. You know, you uh, when I first got these, they were so I could only wear them for maybe an hour, hour and a half at a time. <laughs> I mean, otherwise your your ears just kind of got. A little raw. I mean, physically. I mean, the sound was great. It didn't tire <laughs> you at all. Sound was fantastic. But uh, those ear pads, until you finally got used to them and got them a little broken in, there was something to talk about. Oh, uh, my ears are so big, they would just sort of leave the tops and bottoms of my ears a little numb until I figured out just how to uh, position them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, the amount of work that goes into them. Uh, it just it's just kind of amazing. Uh, they're yeah. you know they the real retro looking open ear design, mm-hmm. which uh, are they're just so efficient though. I mean they're they're rated at thirty two ohms. You can yeah. play it on an MP three player and it sounds great. Uh, they won't eat up your batteries like you know the the higher uh, resistance type uh, um, earphones. 
And, uh, you know, I, I think PCs are finally getting to the point where, I mean, I'm looking at like the, uh, the Asus Crossblade Ranger behind me that uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing some testing on. Uh, it's got a pretty significant amount of design work in the audio functionality. And it's, it's to push higher end headphones and, and to be more accurate, to have right. less noise, less ring, all these things that, that audiophiles hate. Uh, but they're they're trying to get just integrated PC sound to a mm -hmm. point where you're not throwing up when you you know put a, <laughs> a high end you know set of hands on there and you're playing high bit rate content that is just pristine and you know still comes out crap because there's so much interference there's just you know the codec is garbage the drivers are even right. worse and uh, we're getting away from that which is really nice and something it's I've been waiting really for for a long time. It's a good thing. I'm going to tell you about yeah. a product I have in for review in a second, but I should take a moment to thank Harry's, ladies and gentlemen, harrys.com, promo code TWITCH, oddly enough. Uh, and it's really, really cool. This is... Uh, it, I should say it. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Harry's. Um, they are a new advertiser for us. Uh, and they're a new innovative company that's disrupting an industry we've all had to pay into and endure, razors. Uh, if you have a, a beard like mine, um, you probably buy razors a lot and you probably hate the process because um, I don't know about by you, but where I am, they put the razors uh, inside of a giant, you know, plexiglass box. Um, you know, you can easily walk out of there with like three razors for like 19, 25. I saw a three pack for $32 once. I have no idea what was going on. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Um, you know, rather than going with a cheap razor because you don't have to get the plastic, you know, box unlocked, uh, you can go with something like Harry's. Uh, the idea that you get a great shave at a fair price. Uh, Andy and Jeff, the crew that founded Harry's, um, they basically want to give you a great shaving experience for a fraction of the price of other razor blades. Um, very clean product design, uh, high quality blades engineered in their own factory, apparently in Germany for sharpness and strength. And you can order online and they get delivered to your house. Beautiful packaging, very, I mean, very stylish aesthetics it was not something I really think of a lot other than loud uh, when I think about razors um, but Jeff one of the co-founders uh, you might know him from an eyewear brand a glasses company called Warby Parker uh, and the idea is that they're gonna do design craftsmanship uh, value and try to make it as personal and engaging as possible for as little money as possible um, I got the Harry's uh, Winston set engraved. It was shipped to my door. It feels fantastic. It's not, it, I don't really think of razors as feeling fantastic other than say, uh, you know, my dad's vintage razor, uh, which was broken in a terrible shaving accident that we won't discuss. Um, but this is nice. It's nice to hold a product that you're going to use, you know, if you're, you know, a, a, a proper human being shaving at least once a day. Uh, if you're a less proper human being than shaving several times a week, it's nice to have something that looks good and feels good in your hand and leaves you with a nice clean shave. Uh, it's good stuff. The Winston set from harrys.com. Uh, do, do me a favor, check it out. harrys.com, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. Use the promo code TWITCH to get $5 off your first purchase. harrys.com, promo code TWITCH. And we want to thank Harry's for their support of this week in computer hardware. Yeah, it's cool. I like having useful things delivered directly to my house so I don't have to right. deal with lines and finding someone with the magic key. <laughs> I always found that a little strange that, uh, you know, I, around Laramie, of course, you can go and buy razors and right. it's not a big deal. You go to Vegas and everything's locked up and it's got anti-theft devices attached <laughs> to all of it. It's like, how in the hell are these things being shoplifted that much and are they that expensive? It's not so much they're being shoplifted that much. It's just that there's so much margin to be made on them. They don't want to give up the opportunity to make all of the money. That's my theory anyhow. It's, right. uh, it's, it's an interesting concept. I believe the chat room somewhere is a chat room on my desktop. Oh, chat room. I have lost you again. Uh, oh, actually, I take that back. I should probably tell you... Uh, it was funny. <laughs> he always had one loquacious one. Uh, we were talking about uh, audio before. Um, have you heard, uh, have you actually heard uh, the dragonfly? No. From AudioQuest? Okay. So 
let me uh, let me drop a couple links in here. Look up Audio Quest Dragonfly, and uh, if you want to hear amazing sound for not much money, it is a USB um, uh, DAC, so digital analog converter. Audio Quest is primarily known for making cables, and I will be honest that they are the kind of cables that I, I usually mock um, because I am a a savage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I, I refuse to pay thousands of dollars for cables, but this as you is, should, as I should, because physics. Um, yeah. Please don't send me nasty emails, Dragonfly. But but I paid one hundred and fifty dollars for this out of my own pocket after hearing it at CES. Um, it is fantastic. So it's a USB DAC with a built-in uh, uh, a built-in amp. Um, it sounds. Gorgeous. It's got like a 40 step volume control. So you don't have to deal with digital degradation of the, uh, of the audio signal. If you raise and lower the volume, which sounds silly. Um, it enables what they call hog mode, which allows your audio application to take over that particular audio device so that you don't have to deal with things like background system noises or other applications writing over it. And it's got a 24 bit ESS Sabre, uh, DAC, which sounds utterly fantastic. It'll do 16 bit 44 Hertz up to 24 bit 96 K. Uh, high res stuff. I'm not the biggest fan of the of of the the high resolution audio, um, just because it seems expensive and I can't hear a huge amount of detail. Perhaps I just haven't found the right samples. Um, but if you want to hear a fantastic DAC uh, for 150 bucks, it's one of the best deals out there, and it's it's a amazing. It feels really good in the hand. It's really well constructed. The audio is incredible off of it. It's driven everything I've put on it from biodynamic like DT880s down to great OSR 60s and everything in between. Um, and the sound is phenomenal. And uh, I thought of that because uh, a sound bluster sent us one of their new, uh, uh, it was fun. They, they sent us sound blaster of all people is doing a, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, if I had a brain, I'd actually be useful, Josh, and I apologize. It would be. <laughs> it's okay. It would be so useful if I could yeah, speak. Yeah, well, they have, a, they have a couple of things. They have a sound card that has an external amp that's just for headphones. Yeah. Um, and it's they, crazy. They have it's, a couple of the USB, and I, I can't remember another one that I, it may even plug into external PCI Express. Yeah. Uh, you know, a sound that's, card type that way. Is that what they you're have talking a crazy, about? Yeah, well, it's funny because they sent, they're like, hey, you may not have heard of a company called Creative and Sound Blaster. And I was like, oh, you are such a nice young PR person. Do you know about DOS and IRQ? <laughs> <laughs> Shh. But the uh, but they have this thing called the Sound Blaster Roar, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll listen to your Bluetooth speaker. Uh, but I also asked if we could um, look at the Sound Blaster ZXR. And I got to say, um, the reviews uh, going up next week. The Sound Blaster Roar sounds fantastic. It's a hundred fifty dollars Bluetooth speaker, and I was actually shocked at how good it sounds because I hate Bluetooth speakers because most of them sound like exactly what they are, which are cheap knockoffs um, made in China, and half the innards are the same on half of the speakers, and they all kind of sound crufty. Uh, but the ZXR has been really interesting to play with because it's been a long time since I've had you know outside of a, a, a few months where I got to play with an Asus Zonar, having a dedicated uh, PCIe. Uh, 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 audio card. So I'm still putting it through its paces. Um, but I got to say they built the snot out of that thing. Um, it's clean. It's very, very clean. And they're claiming like a signal to noise ratio of 124 decibels, which is, uh, I, th I think ridiculous is a word yeah. I'm comfortable with for describing that level of, uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's just a, that's just a lot of range. Uh, yeah. the daughter board's interesting too, where it basically is, uh, uh, they basically have a daughter board to do optical output. Um, you can play around with uh, the DAX uh, and a big volume control. And having actually built volume controls just to control my headphones off of my uh, PC, I can say I can really appreciate a, uh, I can really appreciate a big fat audio control. Look at all those capacitors. Beautiful, that is a lot. Capacitors. That's a huge <laughs> amount. And look at those head, that, the headphone and the yes. uh, mic inputs. Yeah, yeah, and the big old that, chunk of copper. <laughs> mm -hmm, that's uh, keeping it from everything else. <sighs> uh, electrostatic interference. <laughs> EMI, right? Oh, my goodness. I think there's a debate in the chat room whether or not Monoprice is worthy. And I'm going to say uh, if it's good enough for Robert Heron, 
and his HDMI testing, it is probably good enough for pretty much everyone. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, yeah, Monoprice is a fantastic place to get deals on cables. Um, interesting. And monitors. Although, apparently, though, somebody's having trouble with uh, one of their cables going out. I'm shocked because actually Monoprice is, we've, we abuse the snot out of HDMI cables and we've yet to have one of the Monoprice cables fail. <laughs> Carl Bob, every game in DOS had its own settings for video and sound in the bat file. Yes. IRQ5. <laughs> Interrupt 7. Yeah. Don't, don't bring back the sad. No. No. <laughs> so, do you remember Pro Media? Yes. The Pro Audio Spectrum 16. That was my first standalone sound card that I installed. And boy, getting that installed was a bear. And it's a good thing that they had a support number because I'd have never gotten it by myself. I think that means we're both officially old enough to be like, you young people today with your Windows drivers being pre-installed don't yeah. know how much suffering you've avoided. Play. Yeah. Yes, I love plug and play from the oh, bottom of my... I, you gotta, oh, you mean I have to edit my auto exec dot... <laughs> <sighs> and the good old days. F9545. Patrick, I still love... I love Monoprice and buy from them all the time. I will still buy from them. Good. Hopefully they uh, get you a functioning cable. Ah, okay. So just had some problems with the micro USB connector. I think they had production problems. Oh, my goodness. You wanted to play games in DOS. You had to have two sound cards and two video cards. Don't make me cry. <laughs> AMD had Interwave, great tech, horrible installation. This is like a trip through hellish memory lane. <laughs> well, audio has always had problems. I mean, we had the uh, the AW32, the AW64, yeah. the AW128. And then uh, do you remember the Insonic uh, audio PCI? Vaguely. And it did so well that Sound Blaster actually bought them and the design and it turned into... I think then it turned into the uh, the Sound Blaster 128 PCI. Oh, and, actually, uh, I do remember that card. That was a nice board. Yeah, they were there, and it was originally in Sonic. <laughs> so uh, they they had always stayed with the uh, well, the Sound Blaster had stayed with the ISA bus, and of course that yeah. was getting phased out. But they didn't have a working PCI based sound card that that actually was worth a damn. <laughs> and uh, so they bought up the competition until they could they could get uh, some of their Autogy cards out. Something to be said for having enough money to float over the rough spots. I will say nope. I cannot stand 3D audio processing. It does not sound like Radio City Music Hall. I don't care what you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> because they had, nobody has had the, uh, they haven't had the processing power available to no. do it well with HRTF type stuff. No. Yeah, and we're getting closer. Oh my goodness. And Spoon just types in the chat room. Started with a 19.2K modem and a subscription to CompuServe. I had a 14, no, a 9600 <laughs> was my first, first modem. Yeah. Screamer. Screamer. Yep. And I actually ended up with an AOL account so I could download a, uh, piece of software to manually address my modem. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think I'm going to call it to a close. If we're waxing down memory lane and contemplating modems, uh, I'm going to stop before one of us makes the modem calling the ISP sound because <laughs> it just has to happen. Or maybe I've just been working with Leo for so long. I expect to hear him start making that sound, even if he's in another state. Um, yeah, thank you, I, everybody. I I have to have one last thing. Oh, please. The first upgrades I ever made to my first computer was a three and a half inch drive and <laughs> a serial mouse. Each was 99 bucks a piece. Money Dude. well spent in my book. I don't know if I can even find a picture um, of an Excel hard card too. And somewhere, much to my wife's horror uh, it is actually still in a box because it was one of the most, oh, this is close. Okay. This is the, this is the larger version. Wait, wait. Oh, there it is. Okay. Burke, I'm going to put the world's most annoying eBay picture, uh, into the rundown because I know you love a challenge. Um, 
This was my first major hardware upgrade inside of a compact portable two. Uh, it's an XL hard card, uh, which is essentially like an ISA expansion board. It was $500 for 50 megabytes. It was all the money I had <laughs> for like the next year. Um, and click one more over and you can see just how horrible 50 megabytes of storage used to be. Oh, there it is. Yes. Pan, pan over. That's how, there it is. That's basically a full slot card. That's like 15 inches of board. <laughs> and that's exactly what I paid for it 20 something years ago. Wow. I had no idea there was a market for these things. What a horrifying Retro thought. Hardware? Oh yeah. <laughs> Wish I'd done that a couple of years ago. Dip switches. Look at the dip switches. Yeah, that was my favorite thing about opening up that compact portable two to upgrade it once was realizing that they had at least four tracers correcting the motherboard that were actually like 28 gauge wire running all the way around the length of the motherboard to jump a couple spots. <laughs> yeah. We've come a long way. We yeah. have. Oh my goodness. Dude, hey man, it was a pleasure having well, you on the for show this week. Me. Yeah. It was awesome. Anything you can tease about what's coming up on PC Per this week? Or will the uh, NDA gods smite you where you sit? You know, I don't think uh, we've got any NDA. I mean, uh, we've we've kind of shot the big guns with the <laughs> Haswell E, uh, the GTX uh, 980. I think we're just catching up on, on reviews, a couple of motherboards, mm -hmm. some video cards, obviously. Um, but nothing, uh, nobody's going anywhere. Tomorrow, um, What's his name? Jacob from EVGA mm -hmm. is showing up on a live stream at PC Per. He's going to be giving away some serious prizes, a, a GTX cool. 980, GTX 970, uh, something like three X99 motherboards from EVGA, a handful of the new Torque mice. Uh, it's going to be a, a serious program, and uh, Jacob's a great guy to listen to, uh, very knowledgeable, really passionate about his products. So uh, go and, and tune in on that tomorrow good and stuff possibly win thousands of dollars of hardware that would be pretty sweet i keep trying to enter but ryan just <laughs> keeps disqualifying me employees friends and family of pc per .com are not eligible yeah. to win pc per .com events <laughs> the cruel irony i don't know i just i think it's like I, I have the vision of you guys like driving down to texas with a van full of a million dollars worth of hardware just going you know we could just make a right, <laughs> go to Oklahoma and have our own private gaming events. <laughs> Man, dude, thank you again so much, ladies and gentlemen. Josh Walworth from PCPer.com. Ryan Shrout, possibly back next week, possibly doing more events. The man is on fire right he now. I'm Patrick Norton. Uh, and we will have the review of the Seek thermal imaging camera posted along uh, with New Create Labs projects. Those are coming up tomorrow and next week on Techzilla. And I want to thank everybody for listening, the chat room for joining in and reminding me of how much I don't miss DOS gaming, not even a little bit. And uh, that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Josh Walworth. <laughs> we'll see you next week on Twitch.